parents around disability in the country, especially 15 years ago, just had to fight. Yeah. You know? Every, everything was a fight. Every day. Every day. Every day you get yeah. up and it's a battle. It's a battle, exactly. G'day ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. My name's Isaac Butterfield and this podcast is brought to you by the amazing human beings harnessing the energy of the earth through mushrooms, the people at Lifecycle. Lifecycle are an amazing group of people. The guys, they've actually been on my podcast a few episodes ago. Go and check it out. They are doing amazing things throughout the world. People like Joe Rogan have been talking about it. Dave Asprey has been talking about it. Impact Theory, Luke Story, different UFC fighters have been using this product. It is absolutely amazing. I've even used the product myself for about four months now. And I have a genuine feeling of, it's weird to sort of try and put it into words, but I feel uplifted. I use the lion's mane and the cordyceps mushroom extract in the morning, and it gets me on that journey for the day ahead. I've been using their biohacking kit for some time now, including the turkey tail and the reishi mushroom for things like gut health and, and just a sense of general calm, which I think we all need in this world. If you get stuck into their website right now, which is lifecycle.com, you can get their biohacking kit. And do not forget to use the discount code in the coupon section, but a 20 to get 20% off. So go and support the good people that support this channel and this podcast and you, Lifecycle. G'day ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Butterfield Effect. I'm Isaac Butterfield, but you knew that. <laughs> anyway, moving swiftly onwards. This episode is fantastic, but before we get into it, this episode is also brought to you by my Melbourne Comedy Festival show. Holy dooly, I'm coming back to Melbourne and you better be there. It's going to be 24 nights. We don't have to come for every night, but you can if you want. Anyway, the link is down below. Make sure you check it out. It's going to be a fantastic time. On today's episode, ladies and gentlemen, we have an amazing Australian. His name is Kurt Fernley. He was at the 2000 Olympics, the 2004 Olympics, the 2008, the 2012. He's probably going to be at every Olympics forever. He's won nine gold medals. He's absolutely killing it. New York marathons, every marathon ever. Absolutely amazing. This wheelchair athlete has done more things than you can poke a bloody stick at. All right, ladies and gentlemen, he crawled the Kokoda Trail. The hardest trail known to man, or at least in Papua New Guinea, is from Australian mythology through the war. He actually went along that. People go, people train for months to go along that, and he crawled it. He's an amazing individual, a very nice man, and he's doing some incredible things for young people with disabilities across not only Australia but the world. Also, ladies and gentlemen, we do have for sale some beautiful stickers which are going to go towards raising some much-needed funds for some people who are suffering from disabilities in Africa, in Nairobi. Roby and Kurt has, through the goodness of his own heart, he set up a, uh, a group over there that helps get those people with disabilities into schools in Africa, uh, getting them out of the, the world that they are in. Uh, a lot of them kept in their houses or in, 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 in conditions that are absolutely subpar. So Kurt has been going over there for some time now and getting them into schools. And those stickers are, because Kurt is a part of the cycling fraternity, I know, I know. He has uh, commented on my fuck cycling stickers, but he's a good guy, so I've let it, let it pass. And we're going to release these stickers, which are fuck Kurt Fernley, who's not a bad bloke, uh, stickers. So all the funds from that will be going towards the schools in Nairobi. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you have uh, that, that cash to spare and want to donate it to something good, go ahead and do that, you good motherfucker. Anyway, here's my conversation with the great man Kurt Fernley. Let's get stuck right bloody into it. Yeah, it's one of those funny things how he utilizes intensity to convince people as well, right? Mm. Yeah, he's super intense. Yeah, but he uses, you can tell that he uses that when he was like, Yeah. Oh, they're coming for your thumbs! Everyone's like, Oh, they must be fucking coming for my thumbs! <laughs> the frogs and gay. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's it. And if you scream enough, and if you speak from a level of, uh, of intellectual prowess, people will just go, oh, yeah, yeah, this guy must be right. And I, I also find if you are articulate enough to the point where people are engaging with you enough, like if they, if like this is like sort of my focus with my videos and stuff is that if I can become part of people's routines, then I will continue to grow on whatever platform I want to grow on. And I think that's what Alex does. Like he just, just every, everyone, that's part of their routine is every single time, every time something happens, they go to him. Ah, okay. Yeah. You know, rather than going to CNN or you go to Fox News or whatever, you go straight to Alex Jones. Yeah. And 
that's just that's are we recording? We're we rolling now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are Good talking Great talking about Alex Jones straight off the bat. Kurt, yeah. hello, how you doing? Good, Welcome man. Welcome to the Very show. Well. It's fantastic to have you here. Do I look straight into the camera? You can look wherever you want, man. You can look around here. We've got a beautiful red backdrop here, absolutely gorgeous. You know what? It's a bit sleazy. It I'm is. Pr- I'm proud. It is. It reminds me of, I was in uh, just recently in Amsterdam in the red light district here, <laughs> there, and that is an interesting place, man. Yeah. You just have the like these these very attractive women just in these red light have you ever been there you just you just sort of get around there and there's people just they come out of nowhere like they come out in the afternoon at like four o'clock in the afternoon and there's just chicks there in lingerie and the whole shebang and you're just like hello you know what you went there you went there pretty quick <laughs> yeah, yeah, went, yeah man it was yeah. crazy look it's hectic i raced in Assen in 2006 netherlands best best race i ever uh well, best year probably i reckon i ever had knocked over three world champs and had a solid night on the drink in uh, in Amsterdam after it. So, <laughs> yeah, man, like the world's the world's just full of these little pockets of just interest, right? And mm. that little pocket. And so is different off the hook. to ever. Everywhere. everywhere smells like weed. At yeah. like nine in the morning, you walk to the cafes. I went to this one cafe. It was an egg cafe. It had five five star reviews everywhere, and they didn't do poached eggs. <laughs> I didn't do poached eggs. I wrote a scathing review and used ex- like just. Did re- they do? Any any eggs? They, no, no, they did fried eggs, okay, scrambled right. eggs. I'm running out of ways to cook eggs, but eggs, yeah, quiche, just the whole no thing. Poached. But wouldn't do poached eggs. Mate, robbed. So I wrote a, I wrote a review with like 15 or 16 egg based puns. Yeah, because I'm a piece of shit. But how and was <laughs> but how was the weed? <laughs> I don't know if there are eggs there at all. Oh, okay. I, yeah. <laughs> but it was great. I, I had a great time in Amsterdam because <laughs> they have the the red light district and then they have the blue lights for the for the for the, the ladies with the, the penises. Oh really? Yeah. And oh. I had a giant man look at me deep in my eye and simulate fellatio, <laughs> and you could see his dick through his pants. So that was my time That's in Amsterdam. Fantastic. Yeah, it sounds memorable. Yeah, Kurt, pretty normal interview. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping that the red isn't put there for any other reason than to, to start it's, the conversation. It's, it's trying to bring you back to 2006 in that well, I'm year. Gl- I'm glad it's red. Now, you've won gold medals. Yeah. You've, yep. <laughs> you've, 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 yeah. You've, you've took that way too, way too casually. A gold medal is a big thing. Uh, yeah, like, yeah. I've won a few. You've won a few. You've been there. You've yeah. done that. Yeah, you know, just casually. Yeah. But you've you've done you've done amazing things your entire life. The big thing that I think a lot of people talk about is the Kokoda Trail. Yeah. You crawled the Kokoda Trail. I know there was other people who have or one certain person that has crawled the Kokoda Trail. I wonder if you could elaborate on that particular uh, that particular man and what Kokoda. A lot of people don't really know much about Kokoda. They know it was related to World War Two, but that was pretty much it. Can you give us a bit of a backstory into what yeah. happened with you, why you decided to do it, and what the entire process was? Kokoda, I think, is it's one of those unique places for Australia because it's one of the places that we fought in the direct defence of Australia. Mm. Well, we've fought in basically every conflict that has been around for the last 100 years, but this was farmers, builders, labourers, all, you know, <laughs> signing up to go... Of course, the, the full professional force, the majority of them were already fighting in Europe. But when the Japanese were, were advancing south, they landed in, in PNG and we sent whatever we had there. And, yeah. um, because, the, you know, there are, there are solemn places. There are places that are, that are uh, for me, like, like hallowed ground almost, that that is, that is it for Australia. Mm. Um, there were. I've always been interested in in that sort of in that sort of stuff about what it is that actually makes a country unique that gives it its its fire. And Kokoda, for me, and it was always there as one of those locations. Um, and I remember reading a book about Corporal John Metzen, and uh, he was he was injured through both legs, shrapnel wounds through his uh, his shins and ankles, and. He would crawl back for nearly three weeks, refusing help. Uh, he would crawl from the front as the Japanese were advancing, and he would refuse help by, from anyone and tell whoever was coming to assist him, there's somebody worse off further behind me. And so they would go by, they would grab somebody who, who, who probably was worse off, worse off. They'd pick him up and they'd run him by and John would just slowly progress his way back. And he made, he was shy of three weeks, crawling um, 
and he was slowly overtaken by the advancing forces and executed before he would make it out. But he ran, he crawled back, you know, barely getting a barely getting a fistful of rice for a feed. He saw his mates dying him around him. You know, who knows the the levels of dysentery, the you know what he's what his body was going through, other than the just the wounds, but. When someone does something like that, you know, man, like even when I was crawling, I was crawling and I had a full belly every night. I had my, my brothers fit and healthy around me. I, I uh, you know, I knew that the end was there. I knew that there was a hot bath and a credit card and my, my wheelchair waiting for me at that, that finish line. So I, I spent plenty of nights saying, Corporal John Hudson, mm. Corporal John Hudson. <laughs> Yeah, tough bastard. Because you, you know, obviously you crawling through that, through mud, through water, whatever the conditions were that day, you think of these people who have done things like that before you, but still the the mental toughness has to be at a point where, you know, I know for myself when things get tough, you can you can think about it before you go into something. You go, okay, I can do this. This is, this is the way I need to do it, X, Y, Z. But when you're in the moment... There's those voices that go on in your head telling you, okay, this is enough, let's give up here. It, it, someone like you has been so successful through sport in that moment where you're doing something so difficult, are those voices still there? And how do you, how do you find that you quiet them down? Yeah, the hardest part of every day was when I stopped crawling. So I stopped crawling about three o'clock till when I went to bed because you'd just be running everything over in your head. And it, you were, I was scared as well. Yeah. Like I knew that it was there, but... I was just scared of tomorrow, there's another nine hours in front of me, there's another three hills, there's, you know, so they were, they were the tough times, but you just back yourself that when you get to sleep, you wake up the next morning, your body be healed a little bit and you'll keep going. But there were moments that, that rocked us, that, you know, like uh, the first time I saw disability on the track, it was village one or two and like young kid, uh, young kid with a disability there, um, naked, uh, isolated underneath one of the houses, just crawling around in the mud, and and uh, I I got in my wheelchair because I could actually use my wheelchair in the villages, and I got in my chair and I pushed over to him, and I remember him being being scared of me, then mm. not knowing mm. what to do because they've never seen a guy propelling a wheelchair before, you know, like like two thirds of the world who do require a wheelchair don't have one, won't see one, and that's just the way the way it is, and. That was the first time that I saw it and I got out of my chair and I, I hung around with him and then I just lost my shit, you know, mm. like I, I, by the time I was crawling away, I'd put a footy jersey on him. By the time I'm crawling out of the village, you know, I'm, I'm, I've lost it. And there were about half a dozen times mid crawl or moment that you've stopped or there was one time where I was one of my, one of my porters who Immediately after that interaction, one of the guys who w was one of our porters on there went up to the boss, said, "He's my, uh, he's my brother over this next two weeks, and his name was Mac. Never left my side. Mac would throw me on his shoulder if I looked like I was a bit of a wreck, and he would run me for for a couple of minutes until I'd tell him, let me down, let me down.'" <laughs> and he, uh, yeah, and like there, there was another time just lying, looking up at the trees, seeing the sun come through out of the canopy, and you just realise how many people. Bloody died there, hmm. losing friends and mates, and yeah, it's a, it's an emotional trek. It's pretty full on. How do you train for something like that? A uh, long, just action every day. So is it is it is it uh, aerobic exercise? No nah, man, it's just brutal. Drag yourself. Yeah. Just get used to where the contact points are going to be on your legs. Um, so I would, you know. You're a local fella. I'd yeah. go to the base of the northern side of Glen Rock Reserve right. and crawl to the other. <laughs> it was on fire yesterday. I know it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah mate. Fucking everywhere it's on fire. I yeah. couldn't believe that because right on the uh, Fernley, spelled differently to your name, uh, right on the Fernley track there, that's where the fire sort of started and built through there. And I was like, obviously someone's uh, thrown a cigarette or lit it on fire at school holidays at the moment when we're filming this, and you just think, what a fucking. What a fucking idiot to do that when you see so much on the news and all that type of stuff. But anyway, it's a whole yeah. different side of things. But yeah, you'd, you'd crawl through there. I would, mate. Yeah. So I would uh, put the wheelchair, so I'd park the car, push to the start of where it would become pretty undulating, turn the wheelchair upside down and just crawl in one direction for a few hours. Uh, probably only go two hours in one direction then because it would take me about three hours to get back just because yeah. fatigued and 
busted a bit, uh, but I did that for 18 months. I'd find stairs and uh, I was living uh, living in a, just a two-story apartment block that had a had a little like hallway. Yep. Like, and so I'd just go up and down the stairs for an hour or so every hour. It was all, it was all just trying to get the practical skills of crawling again. And they're not, it's just not a natural thing. Crawling is mm. just. What does that do to your upper body strength? Like what do you, do you, do you go into the gym and bench press? Is that like a big part of your training or? No, nah, mate, no. So if I, I try and steer clear of the gym, if I'm, if I'm going, I work the uh, work the engine. If I'm going to the gym or rear, but all kind of prehab, so work sure. every muscle that I don't use in the chair. Yep. If I need to put on strength, mate, I I, but my, I would have packed on muscle during that year. Yeah. Yeah. For not sure. efficient muscle. Yep. So not muscle that was really good for racing. Yeah, it yeah. probably hurt my racing a little bit. Sure. Um, but yeah, you're doing so much damage that you, you, you know, everything had no alternative but to get bigger and adjust. So how many days was the Kokoda? 11. Okay, 11 days. I mean, for anyone who, who, who trains a lot, you know that after, even if you're doing a two a day sort of training, uh, a split or whatever you're doing, after day three or four, you need a rest day. How yep. is it moving through that? You weren't, we weren't going to have a rest day. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, how, no do you get, how do you get through that? The, the, the pain of, of just your muscles going, we need to stop. Yeah, it's like, uh, it, it feels like you've been put on a rack and just ripped apart. Mm. There is no part of you that's not, not sore. Um, we had a couple of half days, but there was no way you were going to stop a day in one location because, like, oh, I'm in the dirt as well, yeah. you know? Like, I'm in, you've you got leeches crawling up your ass and it's like... Fucking hell. It's, it's just like, you just, I couldn't have, I couldn't have done it a day quicker, but I couldn't have done it a day longer. Like, I just couldn't have spent another, <laughs> another what, day in the mud. What and was that moment crossing the, the, the finish line? Was it a relief? Just or? relief. Just oh, relief. Dude. Like, there was nothing more than relief. Yeah, but the local fellas, like, it was funny. It was real education. They were tough as nails, mate. Genuine dudes who would just, like, every single night, my Mac, my porter, would sit down next to me and he'd say, tell me you want to go home, I'll have you there by the morning. Wow. So he'd tell me, you want to get home, I'll put you on my shoulder and you'll be there by morning. And he, wow. He said that again and again and again every night. And yeah, man, like, yeah, by the time we just got there, it was just emotion. Are the locals moving through that area differently to Westerners or differently to Australians in this case? Well, they, no, it's they, the Wild West. Yeah. Like, it, like it is, it's hard to believe it's a three hour flight from, from Australia, you know, like it's, so the, when I first landed there, it's life's pretty yeah tough, pretty basic. And one of the things that got me is that the Bush Telegraph was working. So I was crawling along a village and then I'd crawl like a K out of the other side and everyone would follow me. And then that was like, you'd hit a riverbed, everyone would stop. Yeah. And then you'd go another hundred meters and the village from in front of you had come <laughs> forward and they were ready to, ready to meet you. And they yeah. would crawl the next, or walk the next three hours next to you. Right. And not on the track, like 10 meters either side, just looking at And I remember looking across, it would have been about day eight. So you, you're full on in the middle of it. And there's a, she would have been a two or three year old girl um, from the next village who had walked a couple of hours to see what I was and then was walking back with me, kind of smiling, dragging a machete behind her that was about that long. Like this is a, maybe a three-year-old little girl. Um, like I got a five-year-old kid and I barely give him a butter knife. No way, know? yeah, like, absolutely. That it, that it's, it's Lego and that's it. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's just, the reality there is tough. Mm. The reality there is very tough. There are some some beautiful parts about it because the communal lifestyle. Like you, you give someone, you get halfway through it, and you're like, "What do I need these earthly possessions for?" You go because you just you're getting a bit out there, and you you give your hat away or your sunnies away. I don't need this, and then because you that you give this to a guy, there's actually a communal ownership of it, and that will then go through five or six people for the rest of the trek, and mm. you, just, you see people they get given two thongs but they'll give one thong to another guy and the next day they walk on the track with one thong on <laughs> so you you can't really you can't really compare it to anything that that you see over here it's just it's 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 the wild west mate right? did it change who yeah, you are for sure 100 percent. 
hundred percent. It made me uh, seeing seeing disability seeing disability as something that is just so fragile. Like, like disability disability and death go hand in hand. There. Yeah. Um, and I've worked with developing countries around disability, and uh, since then, I've I feel like I've kind of inoculated myself a little bit that you recognize that you recognize that there is that complete difference in the reality you do what you can to help but you can't hmm. you can't help every single person so you make sure that you go in and you do what you can and it doesn't stay with you uh, that one stayed with me hmm. you know like the first one stayed with me because it just rocked me you know hmm. like Someone brings a kid out who has the, he, he, I'm cloned, right? Like the exact disability of me. And um, they push him out of the bush into the, in a wheelbarrow into my path and just. That's crazy that it is the same situation that you grew up in and have, and you're facing it in a jungle. Yeah. With a young kid that's. You yeah. know, obviously doesn't have the situation that you have around. The, I don't know about his support structure and all that type of stuff. But mate, it's it's the sort of thing. Well, disability never get, rarely get gets educated. Yeah. So that means that when so say if you've got three kids and and you have to pay for a uniform, you you, you send one, right? Yep. Kid with disability never going. Uh, a lot of the times, disability even lacks that that level of communication mm. with neighbors and so the the communication skills are also taken back a bit and they're they're often kept just in a inside in a room because there there is this overwhelming amount of there is love but there's also shame yeah and um and and that kid is just they're just isolated well are they looked down upon do no, you think it, it, there's a feeling like my mum felt like she did something wrong when I yeah, was Yeah, I think a I lot of a lot of people who have kids who with like my brother has autism and I know that my mother of, often questions like what what, what did I do? Yeah. You know. Yeah. So my mum Yeah, my mum felt like she did something wrong when she brought me home and community convinced her that she didn't. Yeah. You know, like the community said that that this is this is just Kurt, you know, mm. and we're going to bring him through the local school we're gonna allow him to find his way where a lot of communities aren't set up to actually be that way and 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 well the majority of communities if we include in the world aren't, aren't set up that way so mm. that means that that guilt that that shame is owned by the mum hell some places owned only by the mum because the you know, they've got this little school in Africa that that you've got this uh, interaction with religion around disability, where disability is seen as a sin and a curse. Yeah, that's brought on by the mum through the birthing process or by the mum's ancestors. So, the, the mum is often then uh, ostracised <coughs> and deals with it on its own. So, it's some pretty heavy. It's yeah, it's, it's some pretty heavy shit there. And, and it? it's tough in Australia, let alone in a third world country. Is, I mean, mate. yeah, I, I I know um with with my brother, like the ability for him to uh, seek help or development as a child, uh, in comparison to what kids have now, vastly different. He's twenty three. Back in the in the mid nineties, you know, there wasn't that much there. People couldn't get answers. My parents couldn't get answers of what. Uh, his certain disability is he's nonverbal and autistic and for him it was like okay well we just put him uh, at this particular school and then what happens after that well we don't know thankfully through time you know more things like the NDIS the funding which is so helpful it's not quite there um, I'm not sure what your thoughts on the NDIS are but but uh, it's certainly a start I mean you know for, for young kids particularly and and families, as you said, like this is such a massive thing for a family mm. to, you know, they've they've had this baby, it's something they've been looking forward to, and then whatever happens in, in the structure of their DNA and their genetics, uh, something is different. And whether it's something like like autism, or that they they they're, they're bound to a wheelchair, or they're whatever's happening, it is a it is a struggle for that family to make that not even not even just to, for them to get by, for, but to make the child feel that they can achieve whatever they want to do or get out into the community. Mm. Mate, parents around disability in the country, especially 15 years ago, just had to fight. Yeah. You know? Every, everything, 
was a fight. Every day. Every day. Every day you get yeah. up and it's a battle. It's a battle, exactly. And isolating because there was no, especially around uh, Asperger's autism, you know, we were, we were managing physical disability quite, uh, not, in, not in the 80s, but the 90s, you know, like 90s, 2000, we're starting to get, all right, we don't, we don't put kids in wheelchairs. We, we realise that we can make schools accessible. We mm. can, you know, figure this out. But, you know, as, as far as um, a, lot of other, a lot of other disabilities, especially associated with intellectual disability or, or, or spectrum uh, stuff, it was just, you're on your own. Mm. And, and the NDIS is, you, like you said, it's, it, it's it just it ain't it's not quite there. No, mate. it's it, a start. It, it, it is step in the right direction. It is, mate. It but is taking 100%. the funding away is not going to take that direction any what, further. What it uh, <laughs> what it what it does is it's fifteen years in. It's not fifteen. It's five years in. It's going to be fifty years in, and it's still going to be getting beat into place. And that's how I see it. Mm. Medicare still gets shifted around, you know, like it's a massive, it's a massive machine. Um, it is, it is uh, a great thing. You know, the, the, the one weakness of it is if you don't have strong advocacy in that fight with the NDIS, still shit out. Yeah. If you have somebody who has a grasp of the way things are funded and the way it's going and can advocate on behalf of your kid or, or you are the, the um, guardian of a particular person, then, then you can get some good gains out of it. But we are going from a pretty shit level. Like yeah. We are, I, I toured around the country for a few years when the NDIS was rolled out and we were going from a place that was the bottom of the OECD, you know, we were going from a place when it came to educating disability and employing disability. We were coming from below the likes of Mexico and Turkey. Wow. We, we did some stuff wrong. Yeah. And, you know, like it, it's, it's shit to, like, to be able to sit here and say that. It doesn't feel great. No. But you've got to say it. Yeah. Or else you're not going to get any change. Absolutely. So change is coming but it's going to take a while and it and it's and it's um yeah the the the, the people that I really feel for now are the, the guys that don't have that strong advocate in their fight for them so what's stopping that move that moving forward because from what you're saying and from my own personal experience with my family it sounds like you almost need a lawyer there with you to get the correct amount of funding or know who to talk to or so an expert in that field to go there. And a lot of people, if you're out in the bush, if you're in the middle of Western Australia, you don't have that access. Yeah, there was a kid in it. There was a kid getting pushed around in a wheelbarrow up in Toowoomba. Oh, because, really? Yeah, because he had to wait two years to get his to get his uh, <sighs> his plan approved. Fucking hell! <laughs> like, Are you serious? Yeah, like that yeah. is ridiculous. Yeah, when it came out that this is what was going on, the plan got approved pretty quickly, but. Look, they yeah, took 30,000 people into the program, in, into, the, into the NDIS in, I think it was March last year, just in March, 30,000 people. So uh, from, from recent, um, recent surveys, it was around an 80, it was either 84 or 86% um, uh, return of, of current clients that said that their life had improved. That they were either happy or satisfied, or very happy with their with their engagement with the organisation. At least fourteen percent of people that were that were uh, either neutral or uh, felt like it was an unsatisfactory experience. Fourteen mm. percent of three, uh, thirty thousand people who are entering in in one month is a lot of shit stories. Yeah. Um, but then on the other side of the thing, eighty six percent of the time they nailed it. So. Yeah, like it just needs to <laughs> continually try to grow into something that is it was meant to be, and it was meant to be. The reason at its at its heart is meant to have three questions asked to an individual: How do we get you employed? That was number one. If that's not possible, how do we get you to be able to give back to community? So volunteer. So what do we need to set up around you? No caps. It's just the cost is what the cost is. How do we get you to give back to community or uh, 
play a role, say, in voluntary positions in mm. whatever it may be. And the third one was that how do we get you to participate in community? If you are unable to be employed, if you're unable to give back through um, that, how do you actually get engaged in community? Whether that's participation in a park run, an art class, uh, whatever, whatever purpose, whatever something. purpose, yeah. yeah. And those three questions should drive every single interaction with the organisation. That's where I feel we should be heading Absolutely. back towards. Because I feel like I, f I feel like the people that because people write me quite frequently about some pretty shit experiences, and I feel like that that three question, that three tier interview, is something that we need to kind of run back to. Hmm. I mean, that, that purpose thing for people, particularly people who are already starting from behind the start line, mm. you know, like that's something that a lot of people miss out on. And if you have a disability or if you're in the position where you are starting from behind the start line and you're in school and you're missing out on these particular things because you're undiagnosed or your family doesn't really know how to deal with it, maybe they've got four other kids who are absolutely fine, for lack of a better term, and you're just like, okay, what's going on here? For them to go into the NDIS, find something that they can actually put their life towards, that gives you life meaning. Yeah. Like how important is that for a young person to, or an old person? Yeah. So I would say now that even if we start nailing the NDIS, nailing it tomorrow, we need community to come along as well. So one of the one of the most enjoyable parts of the last five years is that I've been working with a company, working with Crown Resorts, around uh, Perth and Melbourne and we started with 30 people with disabilities employed now we're up to uh, 480 wow. most of them high need most lots Asperger's autistic um, a parent came in uh, last last year just the end of last year and they spoke about how before they ran into the, the crown ability program how she was uh, the mum was a, a, a full-time carer of her two sons 17 and 19 both who were uh, high needs um, high needs autistic mm -hmm. um, and the father was there as well and came in and spoke of this story about how he drove home from work one day and and um, there were no supports they, they 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 weren't high enough i guess or the the time the program hadn't uh, extended into their region so they were receiving no support they drove into the garage and he saw a rope on the ground and he just thought oh, gee oh, that must have what, like why are we what are we doing here you know mm -hmm. just thought i thought that was in a cupboard or when it was, got out of the car i mean and uh his wife was sitting in the kitchen on a butt just bawling and she said that she was at a place where she was um she she had thrown the rope over a rafter and and um, she was just tired and uh, yeah. she got pulled out of it by one of her boys um, started screaming and it just kind of woke her up and and she went inside and she she helped and she she just then just burst into tears and by chance, uh, by chance, over the coming weeks, he ran into the program that we were we, we, that I've been working with and started engaging with there, and uh, and and uh, their, their boy got a job there, mm. um, uh, four days a week, um, started earning his own money, started to be able to find his way to communicate to people outside of his mum and dad. Now both boys are employed; they're learning how to over. Over a period of time, they're learning how to live independently. We need more workplaces bringing people with disabilities within it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The effect is not just the individual; it changes the life of a of a parent. And yeah. if we fund if we fund disability to the, uh, the to the absolute mint of how it's meant to be, we can't have that kid being knocked back. And that's all that mum and dad had already been looking for work for him, already looking for. For, for somewhere for them, could never found it till they walked through a door that was hmm. looking for them really. And just that level of em employment is purpose. Purpose gives you a bit of hope. And, yeah. and, and people with disabilities and their families need hope. Absolutely. That's a, um, that's a beautiful story. To think shit. That it's, it's, it's a shit story, but it's, but it's a beautiful story. To think that that's able to allow this family to live. Yeah. And that's, all we're trying to do.
Yeah. Like any able-bodied or not, you're just trying to get through every day. You're trying to feel, you're trying to feel like there is hope there. Yeah. And uh, that family, that family, hope was removed. <sighs> Mate, and, and there's so, and that, and that is the sad thing, the horrible thing about it is there are so many families where that is still very much the case right now. It is, 100%. And, and, and hopefully there are right now some businesses listening that perhaps would be interested in having someone who does have a disability come on board in some some facility. Look, so out of that, out of the, the program that was started in Perth, they actually, because it was just operating within that one uh, facility within the resorts associated with Crown, uh, they started a hospitality dis disability network and now they have, I think they're up to about 15 different uh, uh, hotels, um, bars, um, I, th I think the airports, the, I'm putting them under the pump, Perth Airport, looking that it will go into there. They've got an additional 50 places for people with disabilities. Last time we were over there in Perth when I was coming home, I got another couple of phone calls because they saw it online that there's this network out there. They were just a local corner shop who said, oh, wow. I, wanna, I wanna see what I can do. Can I join this network? Yeah. And they joined the disability network that had, had, that had set it up and uh, they were able to employ another one person with a disability because they come into this network and they get given the skills to succeed in work because you've got to make sure that it's not just give them a job, it's give the individual the skills to succeed once they're there. Because there's, uh, if a dis person with a disability goes through the doors and they fail, how long till they go back? They've already been beaten up over the last couple of decades. They need to make sure that it's done well. And this place is going good, mate. We've got a 70% retention rate of 480 people with disabilities. Hmm. Like it's working. It's a better retention rate than a non-disabled part of the business. Wow. Do you think that your, your hours on the road with marathons, your hours in the bush with the Kokoda, all the training you've done since you were a child, coming up through the ranks, learning how, to operate your machine, your body, your chair in a way that can, you can propel you forward at speeds to, to, to allow you to win gold, all those type of things, those hard fought battles. Do you think this is your next battle? Employment? Oh, look, if I could do, I feel like there's so many, so many battles what out are you there. Doing? What are you doing now? Now, I do, man, lots of stuff. So I think that if I could choose one direction that I would go, one, it's so hard. <laughs> it would be educating disability abroad. Okay. Because that is, uh, you know, that is just, the, it, it is a brutal reality. And there are hard realities over here, that, like I was saying, but we need Australia to take on them fights. We need everyone to keep f fighting that. Um, some of the most meaningful parts that I've had is when you land at a place where a person, a kid with a disability, has never seen another person with a disability with any sort of power or choice in their mm. life. And you can go in there and you can fight and you can see change happen pretty quickly. Uh, last April, I took my mum over to a slum in Africa. We're in a school, met two kids using a wheelchair that was donated at school. They don't have wheelchairs at home. They got them in the school and they were being pushed around. And I got told when I was 13 by, uh, I think it was Michael Callahan, when I came out of the bush, he said to me, cut those handles off the wheelchair, get rid of those brakes. You choose where you go. You don't <laughs> let anyone, you don't let anyone push you. You know, you choose how to go, where to go, and when to stop. And these kids were being pushed around, and I, I had a yarn to them, and I was like, "You don't let, you don't let no one push you. You know, I need you to be strong." Yeah. And then at the end of the week, these kids were, whenever a, a, one of their classmates would grab the wheelchair and push them, they'd turn around and hit their arms away. You know, like ah. that that little kid then yeah. just learnt that he's strong. He's stronger than he was last week. Yeah. You know, like that. That I, um, if I could do that role full time, I, I would definitely. How can you turn that into a full time role? I won't. You won't <laughs> I, know you, I know you've got a family, you've got kids, you've yeah, got everything I, going I on. So, so what, I, what I do, I, se I separate life. I separate life that I will spend at least, I'm going back there in April. And I make sure that, that when I do that stuff, it's with my entire family. To Africa? Yeah. 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 So I've set a, I've, I've got a centre now that's called the Curb Family Centre. We've got 75 kids with disabilities in it within, uh, within the uh, uh, Makuru slum in, in uh, Nairobi. And 
I take my mum there, my wife there, so that the whole community, you see a guy in a wheelchair that has a non-disabled wife whose mother comes over, because it started, we got, we had eight mums looking for some help, you know, like the mum, like the mum that I'm talking about in, in, you know, in Australia that just needs a hand, because these mums were carrying their kid with disability on their back, they're left on their own, so. Started with the mother support unit, um, eight, then it started with eight kids, now it's 75 kids. Oh, I took my mum over there this last year. Uh, this year I'll go back on my own. Next year I'm going back with my boy, he'll be six. He'll go through the school, because it's a mainstream school as well. Right. It's a it's a, it's a, a, a resource centre or a centre to, to bring people with disabilities in, in the heart of the school. Um, and they are able to access occupational therapy, they are able to get their disability assessed, but then we are able to actually integrate the kids. So mm. where possible, um, two boys in wheelchairs, their names are John and Peter, they're integrated into mainstream classes. Um, so I will spend at least a week, two weeks, a year, every year, in and out of that school. Where possible, I'll try and make a second at some point in time, somewhere where I find the right facility and the right, the right environment that it's going to work. Um, but I will sink a bit of work into the employment space because we do need more. We need that story that's working in Perth. We need that everywhere. Mm. We don't just need it in the hospitality industry. We need it in the we need it in the finance industry. People, you don't know how many rooms I've gone into where they say it wouldn't work here, and then you get a person with a disability in there, nailing it. Yeah. Um, so I will. Part of my life is about talking about that story, the success of it, and, and hopefully encouraging that to grow. Um, I do a bit of work in kids, uh, with kids around self-image and, and pride and uh, recognising that that, that that thing inside you, you own that, you know, like the, 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 I went into juvenile justice a couple of months ago and you go in there, whatever's happened before here, like nobody, not even that past event, nobody gets to tell you who you are, mm. you own it, you can find something positive out of what is a pretty shit situation. Like they're doing six months through, one of the kids is doing 30 years in there, right? So, or even into just local welfare, uh, like uh, support units. And so my life is split. Mm. Yeah, I'm gonna work with kids, I'm gonna work with kids abroad. My own work is, uh, I'm a, I am a high school teacher, but my own work is also in sport, uh, sports governance, to making sure that we do get sport give access to sport to as many people as we possibly can and also into um into uh talking to businesses about culture and support networks and uh, all that mm. so i'm doing plenty you're flat out yeah, yeah <laughs> you're man, on yeah. fire yeah i mean but i think it's important to have all those you know those uh plates spinning you know I, I know for myself if i'm not flat out i feel like i'm being lazy i don't yeah i don't do it well no i don't do i don't do board well no. so we've got a couple of hundred acres just out of Newcastle and yeah I don't do board well like I just I've got to keep moving are you still training uh yeah yeah, yeah man, I'm trying uh I'll, I'll probably do I haven't raced for 12 months haven't hit a start line probably won't hit a start line until uh I reckon I'll do New York this year the marathon yep. yeah 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 uh, biggest and best marathon in the world well wow. take my kids over there and just have a hit out but I haven't got in my chair for about eight months. I okay. just, I don't know why, I just can't. You're busy, that's why. Yeah, well, you know what? <laughs> the joy that I was receiving out of the challenge of racing wheelchairs, it shifted. Right. The joy, the joy is now in the challenge of everything else. And um, I would rather, like I, I sit and look at my chair and I'm like, I would rather put Harry in the car and go to the farm and dig a hole and plant a tree yeah. for two hours than get in my chair and have that selfish, well, it is. It's, it's a one person thing. Yeah. It's very much within yourself. It's like fighting or whatever. It's not really a team sport. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a battle within yourself. Yeah. Now you've got kids. You've got kids that you're looking over after overseas. You've got all these plates spinning, as I said. Like, man, like, I think as you get older, your challenge just changes. Yeah. And things you thought were, even me, uh, just approaching 30. <laughs> still, got, still got a couple of years. But I, I look back at the things that excited me when I was 18, and now I'm a. 
absolutely a different person. Yeah. And you, I, I know you hear that. You hear that a lot, but especially being a young a young bloke, like you, you think of yourself, you know, you you have to be down this straight and narrow, you know, as a, as a footballer, you know, you go to the pub, you do this, you drink or whatever. But my life took a mad, uh, just a, a completely to a completely different turn at, at, at one point, and I became a different person. What I turn? Said, what what triggered that? Well, I started uh, I started having these epileptic fits, okay. and I, uh, I I just started uh, having these issues. And, and all that happens for me is I I lose control of this eye. It turns behind me like I'm trying to look behind myself. I go blind in that eye, and my head gets stuck like this. And then at that point, I was sort of, that was my 21st birthday, and I felt like the doctor said it could be, it could be uh, this disease which will have you wheelchair bound without the ability to move eventually. And that scared me, obviously being a, a bloke who loved playing footy and all these type of things, the idea of not being able to move was terrifying. And uh, so I sort of went to the point where I was like, okay, I might not be able to live soon what do i want to do and all mm. i wanted to do was stand up and so that gave me the the courage if you will the motivation to go ahead and and do write my first five minutes and go ahead and do stand up and so that was probably the worst thing the worst news that i've had uh in, in probably the last decade but also the catalyst for change in my life I, I spoke about that in my first special i was like this is this is the reason that this show was named bad for your health and all those type of things and you know i stopped drinking a, a lot of the time i still enjoy beer but i stopped drinking i focused on uh my health my mental health all that type of stuff at that point and and really and really tried to make myself a better person for my future kids and all those type of things and isn't it funny how you you, you get to that point of being broken mm. and it feels like the world opens up a little bit yeah yeah yeah, Man, yeah. I, I had I, I've had that a couple of times. Like I, I had that problem when I was 21, and that opened up the stand-up realm. And then uh, two years ago, I had problems with panic attacks and anxiety, just randomly out of nowhere. And this was like, uh, I would have these issues. I would have extreme anxiety, 24 hours a day for about a year and a half. And you'd go on stage? Yeah, mad panic attacks while I was on stage. Like I was about, like I was about to faint. Like I was dizzy, uh, sweating, freaking out all the time tense like ridiculous muscle tension like you've just done the biggest back workout of a lifetime and i'm on stage to the point where like i can't uh the, the light the bright lights would disorientate me I, I would lose track of where i was looking but i managed to do an australian tour while i was like that mm. and that was insane for me because that was something that i really really struggled with but to go through that and now i'm coming out on the other side of it where the, the panic attacks are much much uh, less and the anxiety is getting better and all those type of things through through you know a lot of work i found myself a better person mm. a nicer person a more in engageable person i can talk to anyone I, i've always been able to talk to people but i really care now yeah whereas when i used to talk to people it was just me opening my mouth <laughs> whereas now i'm taking in what people are saying i'm enjoying enjoying the happy moments in life uh tenfold to what i was and I think that it's just one of those things that you get down in the deep pits of despair and you come out on the other side yeah. far better. Yeah, man, when you're on that edge of being broken, you learn a bit of self-awareness. Yeah. Because you know how easily it can turn. Mm. So I, can, like my, week, my week is every, every second day I'll get an email from someone who's just all the family around that person who's just broken their back, their neck, lost a leg. Um, it's there's some some heavy heavy shit out there, mm. and that's the thing I try and I try and get across that that this is this is the worst day of your life. Like this is the worst day of of. Uh, uh, your life, your kids' life, uncles, whatever, whoever it is, but but don't close off what might come from it. Mm. You know, like the whole family, the whole family. There may be something that comes from this in five, ten, fifteen years, because there is a level of there is a level of gratitude that just comes out of that, mm. and and it's not uh, like so many people who break their back in not straight away. I'm talking two, three, four years down the track say holy shit i'm better for it yeah because there is a level of the, sometimes if you are able to get through it in a way where you can put that realize that you know what i was 
close to losing everything and I didn't. Rather than the other way, I've lost everything that I want and I want it back. Then life can lighten up a bit for you. Mm. And And often it's it's acceptance. This is the card I've been dealt. And and even with like anxiety I was talking before, you try and fight that, you just get lost. Yeah, 100%. You know, you just got to, I always say it's, it's very easy to get lost in the catacombs that are your mind. Yeah. Because there's so many different ways that your thoughts can turn and spin. And particularly if you've suffered a, a serious injury or you've had a setback, you've lost your job, you lost yeah. your relationship. These are all these, 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 these constraints that are locked on around your head. And, and if you can't, you can't think your way out of them, you have to change your mindset. And that, that only comes from time. Yeah. I found that it's taken me two, two and a half years to get to the point where I am at now, where I'm a relatively calm human being, back to what I used to be like. Uh, and, and without time, none of that happens. Yeah. Like, and I think we, we are sort of a species where we have to have answers and we have to have results as soon as possible or it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. But I think successful people and people who overcome tragedy or change, uh, they have the ability to realise that this takes a lot of time and it's not going to happen right away and you just have to stick with it and do your best. Yeah. And I, I think that a lot of people don't have that. No, that I think we all have that ability, but have that uh, that recipe within their own lives. And I mean, particularly with young blokes who refuse to bring these conversations up when they're struggling. Like I know that if I didn't have a support network around me when I was doing it tough, man, it, it could have been a horrible story. Yeah, you know. And a lot of people just don't have that. Uh, a lot of people who are, I've never had depression, but I, I, I know people who have it and it's, it sounds like a horrible situation to be in. If you have that and you work on a work site, you're throwing on fluoros every day and, you, and you're moping around having a terrible time and you can't talk to them and your boss is having a go at you because you're not working as hard. Like what a deep pit of despair you're yeah. falling into. Yeah. Mate, I always think of it if you are, if you are out there and you are really in the depth of depression um, and you're not seeking help, you know, like it would be like me... Your body is your body is uh, not producing a, a part of itself, uh, like my body isn't producing, wasn't producing the strength in my legs to carry myself around. Mm. By not seeking help to replace those those hormones, those those feel good parts of your body, yeah. it'd be me refusing a wheelchair. Yeah. So we need to look at depression as a as a physical. There needs to be a physical adjustment within your body. Not a, you know, you're not you're not um, you're not having a sook. It's not a it, it's not a, a a fake puff of air. It's real. It's real. So talk to your doctor. And uh, you know, like they might have that particular wheelchair for you. Yeah. That that that, phys- that physical change that can happen within your body like that yeah and i talk about it a lot in videos and when i'm talking to people the first thing you need to do is go to your doctor get a mental health plan and they will steer you in the right direction Mm. and you might not have the answer for a couple of years but it will come and it will be worth it and like i look i look back and and everyone has shit days and anxious days where you think oh it's back it's at its worst you know or if you if you've if you've lost a limb you know you're having terrible pain and it's the worst it's been in years and you get through that and you look back and you think of all the great times you've had within your life in that period and you think, thank fuck, I still had those times mm. to do that. And I mean, as I said, with, with young blokes and, and, and with women, you know, it's just so easy to, to shut yourself in, just stay at home, not talk to anyone and, and become this, uh, this person that you never thought you would be. And then, unfortunately for so many people, it ends. Yeah, and as you said, with uh, with the lady, lady with the young kids, you know, you you can't find anywhere to turn. Yeah, and often it's too late at that point. So go and see your fucking doctor, <laughs> dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's uh, who would have thought we'd go to to this point in this podcast after starting talking about Alex Jones? You know what? I thought we were going to bring up fart jokes. <laughs> Mate, no, I'm a serious individual. I'm 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 not I'm not fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, comedians, comedian, they're, they're, you guys are like dark. Usually, mm. there's a there's a bit of the uh, more that I meet comedians, there is a uh, there's something that there's something there because it's 
ballsy to go up and go, you know what, out of these things that I've just wrote down, I'm going to make a shitload of people laugh. Yeah. And you go, like, there, there needs to get to a place where it's like, I don't know, man. Like, the more I meet comedians, the more I'm like, you guys have got, got the, some shit going on. Comedians are crazy. <laughs> Crazy. They're all mental. They're all bad yeah. shit. Like I may, I've made, I've met a lot, you know, hundreds, and everyone has an issue, you know. They're but they're but people who are successful things often are crazy. They're like on the they're on the brink. Yeah, yeah. They, they're running that way. But I mean, the, crawling the Kokoda Trail, not the most sane thing to do. <laughs> I'm a bit loose. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's why that's why you're good at what you do. Yeah, because you have whatever you have going on in your head that says. I'm going to do that. Yeah, there is a there is a uh, an intensity and an extreme part there that I can switch off for you. You know, that's yeah. probably the thing that that does it. Like I can go on. You and, just do it and just do it. You know, like yeah. I, if anything, if fear creeps in, it probably sends me further into it. Hmm. So if there's something there that 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 I feel a, a bit of fear in there, then it's like something takes over and I start heading towards it. So, yeah, yeah. I got the I got the the gene. I have fear in weird <laughs> situations. Like I, I don't like I get more nervous now ordering a coffee at Macca's because I don't want to say how many, I don't want to have to say almond latte six times <laughs> than I do going on stage in front of two thousand people for whatever <laughs> reason because I'm like okay. Almond latte, almond latte, almond latte. <laughs> she said, what milk? It's fucking almond latte. Why would I have to answer what milk? Obviously almond. But then I walk on stage, I'm like, yeah, hello, how are you doing? You know? Actually, What's at the moment, on? it's the same. I could go in front of 10,000 people and have a yarn. Yeah. Um, you put me, you tell me to walk from one end of a crowded pub to another, <laughs> yeah. it's the worst. I bet it's the it's fucking the worst. It's the worst. Uh, if I get into a pub, it's just, if I'm hanging out with my mates, it's back corner, sit with your friends, yeah, and I'm yeah. like, I'm not moving for a bit. I just, I don't know why, like, I just don't like, um, don't like being in around, like, big groups of people unless it's, there's purpose there. Yeah. I, I'm okay with groups of people if I'm on the stage. If I'm in the crowd, I'm just like, fuck this. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. like, like, like concerts and shit. I don't like being in concerts because I'm bigger than everyone and I feel bad for the people behind me. So I'll just go and hang at the back. But if I'm in a stage and there's a thousand people out there, I'm like, whatever, this is, this is me. You know, you've come here to see me, all right, motherfucker, yeah. you're going to listen. <laughs> what, to whether I have something funny to say or not, you're going to be there, you're going to sit there quietly and enjoy it, all right? If you don't have a smile on your face, I'm going to carry on like a pork chop until I make you smile. Yeah, so, yeah. If you don't I, have a smile on your face, you're going to cop it. <laughs> Well, that's pretty much it. Yeah. I'm, I need to, with hecklers, like I just abuse people. I'm a horrible piece of shit when it comes to hecklers. Like, I don't know if that's a lack of creativity, but I'll just insult whatever they're doing. Like if they're, if they're overweight or if they're rather ugly or I tell them to do horrible things, like they drink, drive home, all those type of things. Like, do you I get just, hecklers? Yeah. You do? At every show. Really? Like, but it's... It's just a smart It's fun. Going, okay. You know, I, I very rarely get negative people. Yeah. I, more than more than most times, it's just really drunk blokes. Ah, uh, yeah. Or really drunk chicks. And they just yell stupid shit out. Yeah. And that's what I hate. I hate it when it's like, I just had a dude in, uh, in Fremantle and he was just blind drunk sitting in the second row and he was just yelling out something like, just like, let me on stage. I was like, no, dickhead. I'm not leaving on fucking stage. I don't know who you are. And he's like, let me on. I'll tell a joke. I was like, no, not out then. And he just kept going. And I was like, mate, I started like, when a heckler starts talking, you start asking them questions because you might find something funny, be able to hit them back, everyone laughs. I was asking him questions. I was like, mate, where are you from? He goes, no, nah, I'm getting on stage. I was like, I kept asking these questions. He gave me absolutely nothing. And then Zach, my tour manager, started playing the na, 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 na. No, 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 hey, goodbye song. And yeah. then this massive Samoan security guard basically pulled him out of his chair and kicked him out. So yeah. I won. Yeah. Uh, I, I made the money and I kicked the man out. <laughs> and ruined his night. So I was pretty happy with myself. But You know what? I've, I've only ever had one heckler and um, I take it on like really earnestly. Yeah. It was, it was because he was, uh, what is he saying? He was saying that he shouldn't pay for uh, the NDIS. Because I don't, he was, he'd had a drink. And why should I pay for the NDIS? Oh, it's not my problem, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, let's let's talk about this. Real you know? genuine it's not, bloke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're a cracking fella. And um, yeah, I had a yarn, had a yarn, and then everyone shut up, you know. Like, but you go off and you're just thinking, fuck, I didn't sell it right. Yeah. 
Like, I need everyone to buy into this shit. Like, I need everyone to own it. And I come off just thinking, what can I say to make sure that that guy, that guy, you know, like, mm. how do I how do I get him to buy into this too? Because he's going to have to pay his taxes. He's going to have to see that it goes there. I need to get him, because how many thousands of him are outside that I'm going to... There's a lot. Yeah, there are. And I don't think you can reach through to a lot but of people. But you know what? I've got to fucking try. You've got to try. You've got to try. And I think trying will only cement the people that are on your side. Yeah. I think there's some people out there that you could, they can you can bash your head against the wall and they won't even turn around to look at you. Like yeah. There's just some people, they for whatever reason, and maybe it's mental demons as well, they're just shut in in their way and it's their way or the highway and I'm sorry, I don't care what, what issues you yeah. need to do, I'm going to wipe my hands of it and I get home and I drink a carton of piss and that's my night. <laughs> that's honestly these people and I meet them everywhere and I'm sure you do too. These people are just different human beings and they're yeah. cut from a completely different cloth. You know what, I don't meet them that often. Well, yeah, they, I get my I get my level of like hate mail-y stuff from You get social. hate mail? Yeah. Why? <laughs> You're starting <laughs> Look, schools mate, for the disabled in Africa. So you put disability, you put an athlete, a non-disabled athlete, and then, and then you put a, a disabled athlete next to him, that disabled athlete's going to get the hate mail. So I get I get I get a note when I'm on telly. I'll get a note to say if I say anything around. Let's you know. Let's make sure that we look after this. But I'll get an this. I'll get a note from old mate who says it's not my it's not my fault. Your parents didn't abort you. You know what uh, I mean? Like shit gets dark real quick. Oh man! Uh, you put two two girls uh, they up up there. Two athletes, whatever. Uh, that girl, that that girl will get. I'm gonna shag you. The you know the the girl in a wheelchair would. I'd fuck the the crippled one in a blah 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 blah. You know, like it it, it gets dark for disability often online. Wow. Yeah. Well, like, I so, I get death threats every week, and that's just like part and parcel <laughs> with the comedy game. I don't get death threats. Well, maybe you should. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Somebody send him something for crop. <laughs> fucking, I don't know why I'm looking there. Uh, somebody send Kurt a death threat. He's missing out. Uh, <laughs> I won't tell you that. I won't tell where you are, where you train your ride around Newcastle. Oh, that please, stuff. yeah. Awesome. Oh, well, that's what we spoke about years ago when I first met you. You said that you're a. Uh, you're akin to the cyclist. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got a reputation. You're a part of the cyclist community. I, I am. I am. A Did we know about this, Connor? Did you do any fucking research? <laughs> Letting one of these pricks in here? Look, mate, I um, the only thing as part of the cyclist community, jokes, fair game. You know, I don't take offence of nothing. You get razzed up by me being out on the road, so be it. Give me, give me an evil. Don't fucking kill me. Yeah, fair. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Fair Just enough. recognize that when you drive by and you pull over in front of me and you slam your brakes on, don't Do you get that? fucking kill me. When I'm with cyclists, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, it's heavy, man. Like, so people are like, I have a drink bottle thrown at you or whatever. And that's someone, get off the road, get a job. <laughs> and I was like, okay, man. Um, but it's the guy that, it's the guy that, you know, turns left quickly in front of you that slams the brakes on in front of you. It's yeah, just, that's, that's up. Just, just come on, you know. Because so. I sell fuck cyclist stickers. I know you do. And I sell a lot of I, fuck cyclist stickers. Uh, I know you do. And yeah. now on my website you can get fuck Kurt Fernley stickers. <laughs> 35% off as well. Uh, wait, so. wait. It's really? So I'd, I'd buy them. No, but we're going to get them made. <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll just ship them to hey, you. Hey, share it. I've got fuck Kurt Fernley stickers. We can, make, we can make that happen by the time this podcast goes out. Actually, let's do that and we'll sell them and give you the money to give to whatever charity Done. you want to do. Done. Get Connor, can we get that to happen? We'll get that to happen. <laughs> Fuck Kurt for the stickers in the uh, comment section below. Head to my store and you can get those and we'll donate all the money. All right. Fuck yeah. Uh, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> I'll buy. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I think it works. Good. Thank you very much for coming in, my friend. I do appreciate your time. If you want to... Uh... We're, we're done already? All right, fine. Fuck I was, you. I was no, committed right. for the afternoon. I took, I took everything Well, how off. long have we been talking for? One hour. One hour? Let's do three. All right. Uh, <laughs> so what else is going on? I'll keep going. I'm not scared. Uh, a little bit scared? Just a little bit scared. All right. What are you doing? 
What am I doing? I, uh, well, I'm just writing a new hour for Melbourne at the moment. Uh, Melbourne starts, I think, at the end of March or something like that. So that's, that's, that's the big fear thing for me at the moment is like I took my tour across the world last year. I did eight, uh, 80 shows in six different countries everywhere and uh, more stand-up than I've ever done before, you know, 80 hours. And uh, loved my hour that I did. I was really proud of it. Went to the end more in Sydney, filmed it, kind of filmed it, and uh, did an amazing job. We had this massive light display. I think they spent like something like 40 grand on lights and sound and all that crazy. And um, filmed in front of 2,000 people, the biggest crowd I've ever had. The roar when I went on stage was indescribable. Never had anything like that before. It was, it, that was scary. That was like there was a, uh, some side, some type of army in the crowd just screaming at me, and um, just to go out there and tell dick jokes as I said, <laughs> just incredible, man. And the big thing from that is, you do that, you shoot it, it's done, it's going to get put out there into the into the ether, the comedy ether, and then you just have to stop telling those jokes. Done, done. Oh, From away. All right, they're gone. So that's the first special I did. That was two years ago. Throw that away, especially I filmed uh, at the end of last year. Now I have to throw those jokes away and I'm in the midst of writing a whole new hour. So that's the big thing that I'm, I'm doing at the moment. So will you test that before Melbourne? Uh, hopefully. Uh, if not, it's sort of just you roll with the punches for the first couple of nights uh, oh, okay. in the comedy festival and that's where people come along. Uh, if you come along to that and you see that show, that will be a completely different show to the 25th show, the yeah. 24th show that I do in Melbourne. And that, that's the cool thing about it is uh, last year was my first time doing it. I thought, how the fuck am I going to do this? This is, you know, the first time I wrote an hour was it took me four years. Holy and now I have to turn shit. it around in, you know, four months. Like, yeah. that's fucking crazy. But yeah, I did it last year. I'll do it again this year. And I, I hopefully I'll be very happy with the product and uh, do that for, for some time and then come back. And I'm just working on uh, as much content as I can. The podcast, trying to get about four or five pieces of content out a week and just flood the internet with my head. And uh, I think that's a good way to do it. And, and I've got people working with me like Connor and, and he's, uh, we're doing some stuff where we're actually, I don't know if I can tell this on the podcast. We're yeah, going, you can. You definitely going can. Hunting for the Yowie in two weeks. Where, where are you? Uh, in Barrington top? I can't tell you. <laughs> Couldn't say. It's got to be Barrington. No, no, I'm no. pretty sure I saw a Yowie up there last time I was there. Really? It could have been a... Could have been Could've me. Been you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know they they reckon they have the Black Panthers up there, and yeah, even they the do, yeah. uh, Tasmanian Tigers. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard these things. I've heard the rumours. But yeah, so we're going to do that. We're going to uh, do just all. I don't know. I'm just trying to put as much interesting shit, things that I enjoy doing. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. You know, looking for the hour, we're going over to Loch Ness, all that type of stuff. And I did actually hear we listened to a Joe Rogan podcast about the uh, potential existence of a yaoi the other day. Really? Yeah. It was one of uh, it was a conservationist uh, okay. uh, who is he throws an idea of an animal like he he just wants to find the animal that's never been found yes. and runs around the world trying to do it. And then Joe tries to shoot it with a bow. <laughs> <laughs> I think I listened to that dude. He was a very interesting guy. Yeah, he was. He'd been on a couple of times before. And he'd, he'd found some animals that he was working with. A, I can't remember what uh, television station it was over there. But he had the show where he goes out and tries to find the animal that is extinct. Found a turtle that was, was extinct. Yeah, mm. that was his, one of his biggest finds. But yeah. I thought he was after a yaoi as well. But... You know what? You can After you something. can find that one. But yeah, there's this lady that Connor has been talking to, and and she swears absolutely up in the Sunshine Coast. It's there. All right. So we're going up there. We're going to find it. I'm going to don my hunting gear. I've got um, I've got Adam Greentree coming on the show as well. He's gonna he's gonna hook me up with some hunting gear, and we're gonna go and find. So if you find a yaoi, you kill it. <laughs> no, no, mate with it. Uh, we'll see how we go. Is it female, male? Who knows? We'll, see how, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. But um, Can I go back to the sticker and then I'll let you out? Um, oh can it be fuck Kurt Fernley and then at the bottom just in real letter letters, little letters be, is okay? <laughs> is that all right? How about fuck Kurt Fernley is not a bad bloke? Oh, even better. <laughs> there we go. Even better. And do you bit the swear words out? Because I feel yeah, like... Yeah, I have my head... As the you. <laughs> Does that work for you? It works for me. Fuck Kurt Fernley is not a bad bloke. Done. For a cyclist. Send an email. For a cyclist? How much riding do you want to <laughs> need? <laughs> Big sticker. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, so we're doing that and then uh, heading over to the States for a couple of months and I'm just going to do the scene over there. 
and just do some open mics and uh, and I was going to go over there and just do shows, but I thought I really want to know what it's like to be an American comic, and so I thought I'd start from the bottom and work my way up, uh, sort of like what I did here, and and uh, and sort of just leverage off some interesting people that I that I meet along the way and and you know get to know their friends and get to know their friends and do gigs here here and there and try and mainly just perfect my craft. You know, I I think that. Um, I, I, I'm coming out with better content uh, on YouTube and my uh, stage presence, my, my, my mic skills, everything that I've been working on for coming up on eight years now is getting better every year. The jokes are better every year and that's just all that I aspire to do really is, is be the best at uh, what I can do. And I've had people like uh, one of my mates, Ash, who I went to school with, she used to come to the Sydney with me and, and uh, when I first started and do, uh, do the open mic uh, scene in Sydney. This is going back, you know, 2013. And she would uh, drive up with one of my other mates, would go down there, we'd, you know, have a feed and have a couple of drinks and I'd go and do my set. And that was the last time she saw me do stand-up and she saw me do it in Rockhampton where she lives now uh, and came along and there was a crowd of probably 350 people, 400 people and was blown away. She thought, oh, I thought you were just going to get up there and do your same old set. And I, she was like, mate, you're on stage for an hour and for that hour that audience of 300, 400 people was captivated, electric. Yeah. Awesome. And I was just like, that's such a, such a nice compliment and something interesting to hear because as you would know, when you are progressing through something, whether it's a career, life, sport, whatever, you don't see these big changes. You just see what happens every single day. Yeah, for sure. And for someone to come from the outside and look in and go, okay, wow, that is massive. Mm. You know, that was a really cool thing to sort of see for myself. So for my, I do a lot of work gigs with, with companies and, um, trying to always do every gig a little different. I did a few over in the US and I found that audience just completely different. Really? Completely. I, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take another gig in the States. Right. Well, yeah. thank you for inspiring me. <laughs> <laughs> what great words of wisdom. No. Be- Never do it. <laughs> no, because, like, I like getting up and just having a yarn. Where in the States, you need to be, you need to be impactful with everything that you're that you're doing like yeah. they're after the win the win the win the win the win yeah, the yeah. win and i found that quite challenging yeah um so but the states has been awesome for me racing wise like i spent three months a year there every year since i was 13. Wow. i actually miss it this year yeah. like i haven't been back uh been to every election there since 20 well since 04. wow yeah okay so i love the joint like yeah. it's it's hectic I can't wait. Yeah, I'm so pumped technical. to go over there. Racing is when you, you when you make it there, it's massive. Hmm. Yeah, in any industry, right? Any industry. When you nail it there, it is a level of uh, you know, of rec- like response that is uh, it can't be replicated. Hmm. And you, you talk about the crowds. There, that is a there's differences in crowds here in Australia too. Like I find that even Melbourne comics. Comedians that come out of Melbourne will, let's say they're doing 15 minutes on stage. In that 15 minutes, they'll have 12 punchlines. If that same comedian, or is rather, if that comedian was born in Brisbane or Sydney, they'd have 34 punchlines in that 15 minutes. Melbourne crowds want to hear these long-winded stories, and then as further you get north, it's more about, you know, really? being punchy. Yeah. Like I try and write a punchline every 30 seconds minimum. And that way the audience is there because I, I, as much as I'm big on, you know, long form content where I'm, you know, trying to help people out and talk about things I think about on stage, I'm just trying to be the biggest asshole I can be and say the most horrible shit I can be and make people laugh because that's the type of comedy that I love. The Ricky Gervaises of the world, the Jim Jeffries of the world, you know, these type of guys who I watched when I was younger and thought, wow, that's stand up as well. I didn't know that that was what I could do on stage. So... For me, it's all about that. And that's what I hope that I can go over to America and, and sort of fill that punchy sort of attitude they have toward comedy. Mm. That's what I want to, want to try and do over there. Whether I can do that or not, I think I can. And I, I, it'll be interesting to see how the Australian sort of uh, style towards comedy works. Because it worked for me in the UK when I was over there. Um, I had great crowds over there. Great crowds in Australia, New Zealand, wouldn't go there again. Really? Yeah. The Kiwis just, I had a couple of good shows and a couple of bad shows and not bad. I'm, I'm a harsh critic to myself. 
If I don't have the entire crowd in stitches, I had a bad show. Mate, if someone looks at their phone, one person, thousand people, I'm like, oh my God, I'm a fan. Yeah, yeah 100%. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've had crowds like going really, really well, and there's one person, one lady whose boyfriend is just dragged into the show on her phone. I'm like, oh. I hate myself. <laughs> it's, it's all over. <laughs> I find that talking to audiences, Melbourne, you get quite a lot of emotion back. Like you can tell that. They're leaning into it, and it's like, yeah. Sydney, you might even get a couple of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. North of Brisbane. But then, at the end of it, they'll come up to you when there's no one around and go, that was the best bloody thing I've ever heard. There you go. But the public display of, yeah. I'm not going to give you nothing until it's done, and I I can have a yarn to you. So I find that the, the, yeah, they're... Even down to their body language, it changes in Australia the further you Absolutely. go. Absolutely. Melbourne, I used to, my first uh, tour I did, there was a bit in the show where I said, right, we spoke about this religion, this religion, this religion, let's talk about Muslims. And the reaction to crowds when you start talking about that religion, in Melbourne, it's like silence. A few people leave. Everyone else covers. Sydney, there's a few people. There's a couple of blokes from a footy club going, yeah. In Brisbane, it's just they stand up, applaud, they're like, yes, they just carry on. They absolutely, they adore talking about, I don't know, it's Pauline Hanson country. It know. is Pauline. Uh, <laughs> or the other fellow. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's his name? Oh, Who let's cares? not say his Some name. Bloke. You say it three times and he peers in the mirror. <laughs> he peers in the mirror. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. But it's funny. It's, it, they're different, different strokes for different folks, sure. you know, and I, I love that about Australia. I think, it's, I think it's really cool. And it's the same with the UK in Scotland. The audience is weird, but happy ads after the show. Yeah. They they laugh. They enjoyed it. They would laugh for a second and stop because they're trained comedy crowds too. They would laugh, really enjoy themselves, and then stop and wait for the next joke. Oh, really? And you go to other places. You go to, you know, middle of New South Wales. You go to, let's say you go to Wagga Wagga. You go to uh, Orange or something like that. You Great joke. Everyone's laughing, really enjoying themselves. And then there's a bit of a chat. You know, they start talking to each other and then you have to get them back for the next bit. Not a trained comedy crowd. Yeah. And I think that's that's also something you come along. Mate, if I go see. to comedy, I won't, like, I won't move a muscle. Yeah. <laughs> I won't, I won't move a muscle. I won't talk to anyone next to me. I'm like, fade into the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I, um, my biggest fear going to comedy shows is being picked by the comedian. For sure. And for me, it is because of the question that every comic asks, what do you do for a living? Because I love going to see comedy shows. Like I'm going to see a guy called Jack Whitehall who's coming out here. Uh, he's a, a, a guy from England and I'm sitting near the front row. And if he says to me, what do you do for a living? What do I say? Am Make I, something up. I, I have <laughs> to be a plumber or something. You're an asshole. That's what you say. I'm a comedian, mate. <laughs> yeah. What an asshole thing to say. Oh, mate. <laughs> I could do this. Right, a funny man. Yeah, right, a funny boy. Like, get up here. Yeah. You fucking pig butterfield. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> but yeah, so this year is really, really exciting and, and I'm looking forward to it, you know. And, and every and every year for me has just been crazy over the last, I think, I think we met probably two years ago and I was... Uh, uh, doing a just a, a little set for uh, for a, I can't remember what it was for. It was for uh, Jane uh, Goldsmith. She was, breast cancer research. Yeah, she was yeah. doing a charity thing. And, and my little niece was in there, and um, you come into the room, and she went, "Oh my god, Isaac Butterfield!" <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that weird, man? Like I I get that at the shops and stuff like that. When I go to the shops, like back in the day, it was footballers when I was young. And now, you know, the entire Knights team could walk past a group of kids and they wouldn't give a shit, but I walk past and it's the, the greatest thing, in my opinion, the greatest thing that's ever <laughs> happened to them, you know? And I think that's so, that's such a strange change. How we consume media and the media that's being consumed, especially by mm. kids, they're not sitting down on a Friday night watching the footy with their old man. No way. No, they're sitting in the room on their iPad consuming God knows what. Yeah. So it's just, she's a different world now. Yeah. She's a different world. So and it is, man. It's weird. You, you talk about your niece there. Like I've had uh, young, young, young girls, it's weird because you have a 13-year-old girl come up to me and they're walking with their dad and they want to get a photo with me. And they say to their dad, their dad's like, oh, who's this guy? And they go, oh, we know him from the internet. And the dad's like, from the internet? <laughs> Wait a What the fuck do you mean second. from the internet? I'm yeah. like, dude, listen. <laughs> it's weird for me too. And I, I, I very much, I will not be me too'd. 
<laughs> okay, I every photo, my hands are in front of me. There is nothing. There is no lawsuits happening. Too every late. Every single photo. Too late, man. What do you mean too late? <laughs> they <been> tweeting. <laughs> is, this, is this your sticker that you're coming out with? <laughs> Isaac Butterfield must be me too. <laughs> Jesus. Okay, now we're going into territory. Uh, <laughs> and on that so note, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no one was me too in the filming of this podcast. It was afterwards that Connor was me too. <laughs> Kurt, thank you so much, brother. I no appreciate problems, it. Yeah. We'll have you back on uh, later in the in the year when we're back in in Newcastle, if you're around and if you want to be on the show. Only if you have the Yowie skin with you. We'll make it happen. <laughs> cool, man. Please plug absolutely anything you want into that camera right there. You know what? If you like this podcast, you probably won't like mine. So I'm not going to You got a podcast? It. Yeah, man. Well, what, what do you mean you won't well, like it? Well, it's super earnest. Yeah, that's not me. <laughs> that's not me. So uh, I, I've started talking to people about what it is to be an Australian. And it's like oh, cool. really, it's like, hey, it's like a warm hug. Yeah, but sometimes it's, people need a warm hug. Yeah. You can't just always take this shit. <laughs> How do people get a hold of your podcast? Tiny Island Podcast. Um, okay. And uh, feel free to go rate it as well. But man, honestly, if there is anything that you can do, bloody you're all, you, you, you own a business, your family own a business, no matter how big, no matter how big small, Bring someone with a disability into it. Search on the line about disability employment services. Bring someone in. That's that's all. Nothing more. So, man, that's that's enough. Beautiful. Kurt Fernley, ladies and gentlemen. And if you want to uh, support this podcast, you should. Give it a like. Uh, be a part of it. Connor, what else? <laughs> iTunes, Spotify. iTunes, Spotify. You know those things. Go and check them out. <laughs> what else? <laughs> hey. We'll be back next week. <laughs> I don't know whether or not Melbourne will be on sale. Melbourne's on sale, probably. Maybe not, but it might be. And if it is, go and buy it because I'm going to be in Melbourne for 24 nights, a brand new show. Can I tell them what the show's called? Will that be? Uh, yeah, well, may as well. Yeah. The show's called Outlaw. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Isaac Butterfield. Thank you, Kurt Fernley. You're an absolute legend. Buy the sticker, the Kurt Fernley's awesome sticker. Kurt, this was never fucking <laughs> Kurt Fernley's awesome. The fuck Kurt Fernley is not a bad bloke. Sticker is available right now in my store. All those, uh, all, all the money raised from that will go straight towards... My school over in Africa. School over in Africa in Nairobi. Nairobi? Uh, Makuru Slum. It's a nice, nice little holiday destination if you're headed that way. Jetstar is now flying to Nairobi <laughs> uh, for this week only. No, but go and get those stickers right now because they're going to a great cause and they're helping kids who are doing it tough and uh, we're in a position where we can help those people and you should. Good on you. Uh, and you can slap it on the back of your car and when Kurt's uh, uh, riding behind you, you can know, he can know that you're an asshole, but a good asshole. Yeah. And that's what this channel's all about. Ladies and gentlemen, be a good motherfucker. Peace in the Middle East. Me dick stinks. I'll see you all very soon. Toodaloo. Bye. Bye.